Good evening and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers on our live stream. It's a real pleasure uh, to have someone back who has become already a friend of the Diplomatic Academy. Please welcome uh, President uh, of uh, Kosovo, Ms. Vyosa Osmani Sadri. Welcome. <laughs> And please welcome also uh, Werner Fastelabend, who is the co-organizer of this evening and will moderate the talk. <laughs> I'm saying that uh, President Osmani Sadri is a friend already of this academy because, for many good reasons actually, uh, first of all because when she was still member of parliament, she always met our students, when we were on our flying Balkan campus uh, in Pristina, actually, uh, and discussed with them, well, discussed with them the challenges of Kosovo and the role of education, the role of civil society uh, in the development of Kosovo. Because every year we send our second year students to the region to understand what's happening there. But uh, President, uh, uh, Osmani Sadria was also already here in this hall giving a talk uh, about two years ago uh, on the issues of recognition, on the issues of statehood building uh, in Kosovo uh, and the challenges that there are. Uh, and now we are here almost two years later. Things have moved in the Balkans and also uh, in Kosovo. Uh, and I don't want to be too pathetical, but actually the, the future of the Balkans is decided at the moment by the outcome of the talks between Kosovo and Serbia, as difficult as they will be and as they already are. This is important for the integration efforts of the, of the whole region. And it's very well known what the Austrian position is in all of this. Uh, we are supporting Kosovo uh, without any hesitation and as much as we can. Uh, and because uh, to a certain extent, uh, the, the experience of Kosovo is something which is close also to uh, some of parts of the, of the Austrian history. And uh, we see uh, how, how fast things move at the moment in world politics uh, and what sort of things can happen as nobody of us, nobody of us actually two or three years ago had really expected that Russia would invade uh, Ukraine. Uh, what's important is also to say for, for such a, an evening that Austria has also some sort of experience with issues of minority rights given to, to groups within the country and also outside of the country. We, have and ha we had our problems with the German-speaking minority in South Tyrol, Alto Adige, which took a long time, 70 years actually, to solve. Uh, and we're still working on minority rights uh, for our Slovene minorities and other parts of other minorities in Austria. So I, I wish the president of Kosovo all the best for these difficult talks which, which, are, uh, which, which are in front of you. Uh, the title of this talk you will give is New Momentum for Kosovo's International Integration. And I think there is a new momentum uh, with uh, the proposals of the European Union, which uh, have to still have to be implemented. And as we know, uh, the decision of, of a step-by-step -step implementation uh, is a, a very difficult one. But the most important thing is really to, re to, to, to find reconciliation possibilities uh, in the region. Uh, it's, it's my clear conviction. Uh, one thing is to have a contract, to have a treaty, to, but the other thing is to be really reconciled. And this takes maybe sometimes longer and um, uh, I'm now almost thinking about how to reconcile the Ukraines and the Russians after this war. I guess it's, this will be even more difficult 
than the situation in the Balkans. But I'm already far away from what we are talking tonight because it's about how the president sees possibilities for a new momentum uh, of international uh, recognition of Kosovo, uh, and we are still counting, 100, 110, 120 onwards, still counting to the end, because the hope is it will be 194 or something like that if they are all the members of the United Nations. Uh, so welcome again, uh, and uh, I wish our audience an interesting uh, and fruitful evening. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, I hope my micro is working. Yeah, now the micro is working. Thank you much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Briggs, for opening. Uh, it's always a pleasure to organize something together from the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy and Diplomatic Academy. And certainly this time it's a very specific moment. Why? Because Kosovo certainly is one of the cornerstones for stability in the Western Balkans. And this also will mean that it will be one of the cornerstone for stability for all of Europe. And insofar we are happy that uh, we have a very nice audience, many ambassadors. I do not uh, want to greet everybody. I just am looking at Roland Bimo from Albania, and there are also ambassadors, of course, uh, from your country, many countries, former ministers like Friedhelm Frischenschlag, and many outstanding people also from civil society, from Pan Europa uh, to UPF. I do not want uh, to mention all of them. This would take too much time. And I'm sure it will be also an extraordinary event for you, because certainly our today's guest speaker uh, is an absolutely extraordinary personality. President of a young nation, young herself. Just last year, she entered the 40s for a state president, certainly absolutely, absolutely unusual. And if you look back, I mean, to uh, her way to uh, this office, you have to say, she studied in Pristina, but also in the United States, in Pittsburgh. Uh, she became also a professor, a lecturer at the universities in these two places and many other places. But this was only one part of her career. At the same time, uh, as a civil profession, she became an advisor and chief of cabinet of the former state president, Sedio. I've met him just, I don't know, 10 days ago in Istanbul. And she also started her own career, being elected into the parliament of Kosovo and having become the chair not only of the Foreign Policy Committee, but also of the Committee for European Integration. And insofar, uh, you can see there is quite some substance behind it. And it was not just by chance that she was elected president of parliament, and as such then also uh, became uh, the promotion to become the president of Kosovo. Yeah, uh, I only have to say it's a great honor and pleasure for Thank us. Uh, welcome here in <coughs> this house. We are looking forward uh, just to your speech, to your lecture, and this is what I would like to ask you. Please uh, take the floor. Please give us just an overview uh, and some information the way you are looking at this situation at the moment and for the future. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Mr. Faslabend, uh, and I want to thank Ambassador Briggs, of course, for his kind introduction. Thank you very much for always being such an excellent platform for all the leaders and the people of Kosovo to send across important messages. It's always a great opportunity for each and every one of us to be back here at the Vienna Diplomatic Academy. As I said, uh, one institution with which I've had the honor and the luck to cooperate with throughout my years in the parliament as a, as a teacher of law myself, but also as a politician in general. With regards to our topic, uh, which is a new momentum for Kosovo's international integration, I want to start off with three key me messages and then perhaps to leave the rest of the time for our conversations for the Q&A with Mr. Faslabend and then with all of you. The very first one is that the Republic of Kosovo is a success story. It's one to be proud of, not just for its resilient people, but also for our allies and partners who came to our rescue, who did not look away, who did not look away from the pain of an oppressed people, but came to save our lives, and through saving our lives also gave us a chance, a chance to build a country, to be free, but also build resilient and democratic institutions that are today a beacon of hope, not just for our people, but also for the region and beyond. Um, where we are today as a country, of course, is the success of so many people who have worked hard to make sure that the institutions that we build are ones that are set on very, very strong pillars. And these pillars are based on the values which, of course, are shared with the vast majority of our European friends and Euro-Atlantic partners. But at the same time, the story of Kosovo is one of perseverance, of determination and hope. The people of Kosovo have remained steadfast on their Euro-Atlantic path. And this Euro-Atlantic path is our choice. It was not imposed to us. It has been our vision since the founding father of our republic, President Rugova, and has remained our path and our vision throughout our existence as a nation, but especially our existence as a country in these 15 years of independence. But I want to point out the fact that our Euro-Atlantic path is not something that we look at simply as a choice, but at the same time as a merit-based process. It's not just something that we need, but we believe that it's something that we deserve. Kosovo right now is at a 100% alignment with European Union common foreign and security policy. 100% alignment, despite of the fact that we still don't have the legal obligation to do so, because we still don't have a candidate country status. Uh, at the same time, Kosovo is a success story to be proud of because in only two years we've managed to undertake democratic and rule of law reforms that have made Kosovo one of the top three countries in the world, worldwide, in terms of democratic resilience and democr democracy development, according to Freedom House. And at the same time, in just two years, we've jumped 20 places higher in the Transparency International Fighting corruption index. These are just two examples, including the World Justice Project Index, which is making Kosovo as the top European reformer in uh, terms of rule of law, that are showing that we're in the right path when it comes to democracy and rule of law. So that's why when we talk about Euro-Atlantic integration, we're talking about a merit-based process, a process which we believe that we deserve, and we're asking for support from our partners not just because we need it, not just because it's our vision, but also because of uh, the merit-based uh, process. The second key message that I want uh, to point out at the beginning is the new agreement that has been reached between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, we believe that this agreement create, absolutely creates a new momentum for Kosovo's international integration. Um, if you look at it and you compare it to every other agreement that has been reached in the dialogue process in these 12 years, and there, there have been plenty of those as you uh, may have been following the process. This agreement is between two contracting parties, between two equal parties, two equal states, 
that according to Article 1, respect the principle of territorial integrity, respect the principle of sovereignty, respect other principles that are embodied at the UN Charter, especially Article 2 of the UN Charter. And at the same time, what is most important, Article 4 of the agreement provides clearly black on white as a legally binding commitment that Serbia shall not object to Kosovo's membership in any international organization. I repeat, any international organization. This agreement has created legally binding obligations for the parties. Some might say there's no signature. However, as you know, according to the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties, once there's a meeting of mind, which has happened in Brussels, and now with the European Union commitment to make this legally part of the European path of both countries by making it part of the chapters uh, that Serbia is negotiating and at the same time part of the mechanisms that we have with the EU right now, they're creating an environment where implementation is key. In this situation, we do have a new momentum for Kosovo's international uh, recognition, if we're talking about individual members' uh, recognition, but at the same time, a new momentum for membership in international organizations. So it's, in fact, this is less about the bilateral relations between Kosovo and Serbia and more about a commitment that we took from our allies and partners that there is going to be a new strong push to make Kosovo a deserved equal member of the international community, especially in organizations where we still don't have a seat. Now, what does that mean? Um, I'll be very honest, for many years during the dialogue, the process had derailed to the extent that even among our partners in the international community, we would hear voices that there should be no recognitions and membership for some time until the dialogue is over, because this might hurt the dialogue since Serbia might get away from the table. We always believe that was the wrong approach, because in fact, the more recognitions and memberships for Kosovo, the more we strengthen our statehood and our international standing, the more Serbia will come to its senses and understand that this is an irreversible path, that Kosovo is sovereign, independent, and will remain so forever, which is the irreversible truth. We are an independent state to stay there. Not, we're not going anywhere. However, I think by sort of pausing the support for Kosovo's memberships and international integration in general, many were encouraging Serbia to be destructive in the dialogue. Now this impediment is gone. The international community is very much committed to supporting Kosovo, either in gaining new recognitions or in gaining membership in international organizations, which is why the agreement and Article 4 that I just quoted in particular are creating this new momentum for Kosovo to not just increase the number of recognitions, because some might look at this as a technical issue, but in fact, to strengthen it's standing internationally by, of course, um, developing friendly and, of course, also diplomatic relations with individual member states, which opens a lot of new doors of cooperation. But at the same time, the more new memberships of our uh, recognitions of our independence, the more the chances to become a member of more international organizations. And... Um, I believe that as a third point, it is very important to mention that we've received strong commitments from our partners that they will deliver on this front, even if Serbia does not honor its commitments. So we always know that historically speaking with Serbia, you have two sets of negotiations. One is to convince them to sign, and the other is to convince them to implement. And the second is always more difficult than the first. And oftentimes they don't, ever implement, as they have with the vast majority uh, of agreements signed in the Brussels uh, dialogue in the past. So uh, there is a possibility that they take the commitment, but then they never implement. Some might say, well, but that is going to derail their European path, since this has become a legally binding uh, commitment uh, from their side as well. Well, doesn't seem from time to time that they care that much about their European integration path, and it seems like they're 
uh, more interested into strengthening their friendship with Putin. But leaving that aside, even if that were to happen and they were to run away from their obligations, the commitment that we have from our allies to kind of wake up uh, the process of Kosovo's membership in international organizations is strong. And I believe that this takes us to uh, more stability in Europe and beyond. I believe that Kosovo's international integration is directly linked, as you rightly pointed out, to stability in the Western Balkans. A stable, successful Kosovo, stronger internationally, means more peace and stability in the region. A stable region means more peace and stability in Europe as a continent. A stable Europe, as you know, is in the interest of everyone in the continent. As we have seen with Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, war in any part of Europe means destability in every part of Europe, uh, especially when key values are hard-earned freedoms are at stake, as in the war uh, against Ukraine right now. For that reason, it is extremely important that we move on with the process of Kosovo's international integration, understanding clearly that this is a direct contribution to European stability. Let me give you a few examples, and I'll, then I'll sit down for the Q&A. NATO, as it is shown in the region, when Albania, Montenegro, North Macedonia joined NATO, it has substantially increased the level of security and stability in the region, which means that if Kosovo joins, that will further enhance stability and security in the Western Balkans in general, and therefore uh, in the entire European continent. Because as we all know, to be in NATO means to be safe. Secondly, every single country that has joined the European Union, obviously it has increased the level of prosperity, but at the same time, the level of security, internal security, uh, within uh, its border and therefore has contributed by exporting security and stability in the region and beyond. The same with our region. When Croatia and Slovenia joined the European Union, that meant more stability in this part of Europe. The more we move on as a region towards the European Union, including Kosovo as an independent country, the more there will be stability in the entire European continent. Secondly, uh, thirdly, I'm sorry, joining the Council of Europe, which is one of our immediate uh, uh, interests as a country, will enhance the level of human rights protections and will allow us to have protection for all people, no matter their religion, their ethnicity or other background, in line with the European Convention of Human Rights standards. For that reason, it is crucial that especially the membership at the Council of Europe is seen beyond the political aspect of it. I believe it's a human rights cause, which is why I once again invite all the member states of COE to fully support Kosovo's bid for this membership. Or to mention a couple of other uh, examples, Interpol. If Kosovo becomes a member of Interpol, that means more effective fighting of cross-border crimes. When Kosovo becomes a member of UNESCO, that means more effective protection of cultural and religious heritage. When Kosovo becomes a member of the WHO, the World Health Organization, that means higher quality of healthcare services and standards. And why is that important for stability? As you all know, because you live in, in, in a country that also has these kind of services, the more and the better social services the citizens of a country receive, the more stability you have in that country, the more prosperity the people have in their country, the less they feel that, that like they want to create security problems in the country and beyond, which is I believe that even with organizations like Interpol for sure, because you fight cross-border crime, but also with organizations like WHO or UNESCO, you actually bring more quality in the life of your citizens, therefore less potential for uh, uh, not having enough security and, and stability. And ultimately, of course, UN membership, because that would close down a chapter of disagreements in the Western Balkans. Uh, and of course, there's one country causing these disagreements, obviously, not the rest, but uh, it would close down a, a very long chapter of these disagreements, and it would finally, finally give the entire region a possibility to move ahead for future generations, to look ahead 
for development, to look ahead for prosperity, to look ahead for a much better life, and to make sure that future generations, and even current ones, our kids, all of the kids in the region, never have to go through what we had to go through. So I'll leave it with that, but just uh, a, a quick reminder. So the first point, uh, Kosovo is a success story to be proud of not just for the people of Kosovo, but internationally. It's the biggest foreign policy success story of NATO allies. Secondly, the new agreement does create, through a commitment in Article 4, a new momentum for international integration. And thirdly, this would not only help Kosovo, it would help the region for more peace, stability and security, and it will help Europe. Thank you once again for your attention. Mrs. President, thank you very much for this lecture you gave us, and especially for <laughs> your very convincing words. One can feel that behind the words is a personality that is believing in what she says and uh, what she is trying uh, to go for. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Of course. Uh, we want to go a little bit deeper into... Of course. And uh, one thing that was interesting for me the first time when I saw your CV was that you were born in Mitrovica. Mitrovica, everybody knows, is this region uh, where there is a Serbian minority uh, within Kosovo living. And, of course, there were quite some... Uh, challenging uh, situations also not so long ago. So maybe my first question would be, just go in, try to go into reality. How do you see the situation at the moment? Where do you think uh, are the real challenges and uh, what can be done to overcome it, not only for the moment, but in the long term? Um, thank you, of course, uh, for, for bringing this question up. Um, there is sometimes the wrong conviction that the vast majority of Serbs of, of Kosovo live in the Mitrovica area. Uh, that, in fact, is not true. Uh, Mitrovica is one of the four uh, uh, cities uh, in what we call North Kosovo, but in fact, uh, North of Kosovo, not North Kosovo, because it's not a region, in fact, it's just a, a number of municipalities. Uh, but in fact, only one-third of the Serbs live there, two-thirds live elsewhere, in the south, in the east, in the west, uh, fully integrated into the instit local institutions, um, contributing to making sure that there is a life together, uh, no matter the difficulties of the past. And there are a lot of excellent examples of how this minority community that comprises about 3 to 4% uh, of our population uh, has been integrated post-war uh, into the work of the institutions, but generally in the society. But yes, one-third live in these four municipalities in the north. Uh, now, to simplify what's going on in these four municipalities, for the past 23 years, but especially the past 10 years, that um, around 10 years that Vucic is in power, they have been using Putin's playbook on abusing the minority communities. So for example, if you look at the 2014 example of what Russia did to come to the annexation of Crimea, they began with uh, playing with the role of m Russian minority there first, uh, creating all kinds of false, false flag operations, and then calling them humanitarian operations, making sure that they uh, pressure the Russian minority to resign from institutions, that of course, Ukrainian institutions. Uh, Serbia has been doing the same in North Kosovo. So they pressure Serbs to the extent that through their criminal, illegal structures in which they have been paying for, supporting for so many years in North Kosovo, they threaten local Serbs to the extent that they have been using violence against them. So even when Serbs who live in the north want to register their car plates based on Kosovo registration uh, licenses, 
uh, they, these illegal structures immediately go and they burn down the cars. There have been cases when they burn down the houses of a Serb. So, so the people who are mostly at risk from these illegal criminal structures led by Vucic politically, but then in action by a couple of people who are in the blacklist of the United States and the United T Kingdom in terms of U.S. Treasury, uh, the, the people who are mostly at risk are the Ser local Serbs themselves because they are constantly pressured and threatened to do what Vucic asks them to do, to manipulate them and keep them hostage so that they wouldn't integrate in Kosovo's institutions and, and society. What we have been trying to do is to make sure that through our security institutions, we protect our citizens. They are our citizens, and we want to make sure that they use all of the constitutional prerogatives and, and powers that they are given as individual rights um, in order to make sure that they are included uh, in the institutions and beyond. But unfortunately, throughout many years, Serbia has also abused the dialogue. While the dialogue was ongoing, and although they signed back in 2013 that they would dismantle all of the illegal structures in the north, what they have been doing in the past decade or so is just strengthen them, strengthen them, and include more criminal elements into them, which makes them really dangerous because we're talking about transnational organized crime groups. Uh, they are using the politics of Serbia also, to be honest, to become rich. That's what they want. Our institutions do not accept to make deals with criminals. We will not make deals with these illegal structures. Uh, they need to, uh, of course, uh, respond to the law. The rule of law is there for everyone, no matter their ethnicity, uh, no matter their nationality. So whoever has committed a crime needs to face the justice system of the Republic of Kosovo. Nevertheless, every single time that Serbia doesn't get what they want at the negotiation table, what they do is they instrumentalize this minority community through the threats of illegal structures to create barricades, to create another crisis in the north, and to create an unstable situation. So this is what we have been facing. Uh, when Serbia doesn't get what they want at the table, they use violence. They threat the use of force. They bring Russian MiG-29s around the border. They have allowed for the opening of, uh, they call it a Russian humanitarian center close to the border with Kosovo. But according to the American DOD, it's a Russian spy center. Nothing humanitarian in that. Uh, and of course they have turned into a country that aligns its foreign policy with Russia and have turned into a country that is now the safe haven for all of the Russian oligarchs uh, that are sanctioned by the rest of, of the European countries. And of course, uh, while they serve Putin's interests, they want to make sure that at the same time they destabilize Kosovo, they destabilize Montenegro, and they also destabilize Bosnia-Herzegovina. Against Montenegro, they particularly want to do that so that they stop Montenegro's process towards European integration because they were the first runners, uh, front runners in that process and doing really well. And they want through this malign influence to stop that because it's not in Russia's in malign interest to have Western Balkan countries join their European Union. So by destabilizing them, they also halt the process of joining the European path. So they try to do that by destabilizing Kosovo's north through uh, 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 extremist politicians in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, who are also, of course, uh, fed by Russian propaganda and at the same time by destabilizing uh, Montenegro. So all of this is part of a much bigger picture. Uh, that it's not about a small city called Mitrovica. It's about a big country that wants to become an empire called Russia that uses another country as a proxy called Serbia who want to destroy the values-based systems that are the European Union and NATO, which is why we should not let them. 
because it's so much bigger than my beloved city. And it's so much bigger than also my beloved country. It's what happens in the Western Balkans on a daily basis is a fight for the values and the freedoms that are very much hard won, which is why it should be the fight of all of us. And I hope that in this fight we will not be left alone. Yeah, uh, Mr. President, you mentioned in your speech, uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, the economic development, not only, I mean, for the welfare of people, but also for the stability of the country and the whole region. And I remember after uh, a military invasion in Kosovo at the, in the 90s, the big crisis, this was a real surprise for me personally. Just, I think it was not even four weeks thereafter when I visited uh, the country, and I had the impression that people had rebuilt all the houses that were damaged uh, through military uh, bombing or whatever it was, quite different to the situation in Bosnia. In Bosnia, you had even half a year, a year after the war, still you could see the damages and burned out cars and trams uh, on the street and so on. So far, I had the impression there is a, a population that really is going to act and is going to look forward uh, and do something. But this is just one thing. If you really want to have a good development in the future, of course you also will need the neighborhood. The bigger markets of Western Balkans, the Balkans uh, all together, because otherwise you will only stay a very small market uh, with limited possibilities and chances to develop. So far, uh, how do you see the chance, you know, that uh, in the coming years there really will be a development into a direction that uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, Montenegro, uh, Macedon North Macedonia, Kosovo can become more or less one bigger market. Do you see the chance, a realistic chance, not only as a vision, but uh, how do you look at that? That is already a possibility through um, the so-called Berlin process, as you know. There is an ongoing important process that was initiated by Germany and, and now is supported by the European Union. And uh, this process has led to a number of agreements that especially aim uh, at creating this joint market where countries can cooperate with one another to be able to not just increase trade between one another, but to make sure that if there is a big investment from, from uh, other countries in Europe, United States, Asia, and the rest, that the Western Balkans can be seen uh, just beyond the individual members, but it can be seen as a bigger market with a lot of potential. Obviously, within the countries, I believe Kosovo has the highest potential. Uh, we have the youngest population in Europe and so many other incentives. But we always understand that we, when we invite a foreign direct investor, we need to explain that investing in Kosovo doesn't only mean investing in the small market of Kosovo. It means investing in a region much wider than the country. And at the same time, it means, let's say, producing in a small country like Kosovo, but being able to export to a much larger European market because we have a free trade agreement both with the European Union, with the region, as well as with other countries in Europe that are beyond our region. So that kind of gives them the opportunity to come to Kosovo as a great pla place to invest, but at the same time through Kosovo have access to uh, a market of hundreds of millions of uh, Europeans, which is much bigger than just us. So I do agree with you that good cooperation, uh, economic cooperation between countries of the region is key. However, we should always be reminded that uh, what um, Professor Edward jo Joseph called trade, uh, 
uh, doesn't equal trust. It's especially important that we remember that about the Western Balkans because of everything that we went through. We should not forget that just over a little two decades ago, each and every one that you see from the Kosovo delegation had to see hell with their own eyes and had to go through hell. We were victims of a genocidal regime that wanted to wipe our country off from the face of the earth and wanted to exterminate the people of Kosovo simply because of their nationality. The same happened in Bosnia Herzegovina. So uh, perhaps to go back to what Ambassador Briggs was talking about a little earlier, which is reconciliation. I think reconciliation is key, but sh we should understand what are some of the key preconditions to reconciliation simply by learning from history or perhaps just the history of Europe. We don't have to look at beyond Europe. The history of Europe shows that justice, justice for the victims is a precondition for peace and reconciliation. And peace and reconciliation is always an extremely important element for countries to thrive economically in cooperation with one another. That is why we have, as Kosovo, always been big supporters of agreements that are based on principles rather than on quick fixes. The quick fixes produce a nice picture of two leaders with a handshake and they are called historic and all that. They don't fix the real problem. Yes, trade is important, but I would agree with Professor Joseph. Trade does not equal trust. If trade equaled trust, we would have never had a Russian invasion of Ukraine. They were each other's main trade partners, but Russia still invaded Ukraine because of their hegemonic imperialistic intentions against its neighbors. Don't forget, we still in the Western Balkans have a neighbor who looks at the others, all other countries uh, that they are surrounded with as temporary states that they wanna grab. They wanna grab the territory. They believe it's theirs, it's not has never been, we were occupied, even historically speaking. Uh, but when they committed genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, uh, they lost every right, every right, to even mention the principle of territorial integrity or sovereignty or any of those to which they never had the right to begin with. But when they committed these horrendous crimes, uh, obviously, that was uh, the, the end of it. And as you know, the International Court of Justice has also reconfirmed Kosovo's um, uh, rightful uh, uh, process of independence. So I think, yes, trade economy is important. It's very important for our people. They need to, f to feel and know that they have a prospect to make their dreams come true, to succeed in their professions at their home country, not look for the realization of their dreams only outside of their borders. So cooperation, economic cooperation between the region is one of the things that can help uh, us out in that direction. But for that to happen properly, we need to make sure that all partners in the Western Balkans truly want peace. They truly want peace. Yeah. Uh, maybe a third question before we uh, also give the public a chance to ask a few questions. Uh, you are a political expert uh, just by your profession and the way of your life. Uh, now we are in the situation, I mean, you talked a lot about uh, Putin's influence on Vucic, uh, on the situation in Serbia. And certainly, there used to be a very strong link Russia used to be sort of a protector for Serbia for a very long period. There were many personal links. On the other hand, uh, of course, the situation has changed. The 21st century is not anymore the 90th century, uh, not even the 20th century. And now we are in the situation, you know, that of course, by Russia's invasion into Ukraine, uh, we are confronted with more or less a self-isolation of Russia towards 
the rest of Europe. And this will mean that also uh, Serbia cannot get really quite some profit out of its relationship with Russia. Do you think there's a chance that the situation also could help uh, to shape a new relationship uh, within the Western Balkan region? If Serbia were to separate itself from uh, Russia's politics and, and actions, that would be good news for Serbia itself, for the people of Serbia, but also for everyone else living in our region. Because ultimately, uh, even we would have a neighbor that doesn't want to destabilize us. Um, unfortunately, uh, we should not live in illusions and we should look at the reality. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, in the past couple of years, Serbia has only increased the political, economic, and military cooperation with Russia. Look at the numbers in their trade, energy. They signed a new Gazprom deal after the invasion of Ukraine at a time when everyone was cutting their deals. Look at the number of Russian businesses and oligarchs going to Serbia. Look at, at the number of forward operation bases that Serbia has around the border of Kosovo. They have 48 forward operation bases around the border with Kosovo. Uh, look at the so-called Russian humanitarian center. Uh, look at the offices of uh, Wagner or Russia Today and so many others opened in Belgrade. Um, Look at the signing of memorandums for aligning foreign policy between the foreign minister of Serbia and the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, in U.S. soil, by the way, during the U.N. General Assembly. That's what they did. So this is showing that while everyone truly hoped that Serbia will come to their senses and really separate their policies and truly choose the European path, not try to sit in two chairs at once. Uh, in practice, not much of that has happened. And of course, there has been an active appeasement policy towards Vucic, an autocrat, precisely to try to convince him to go the European path, to choose one, because he can't walk on both at the same time. I don't see the result yet. Let's hope that it might happen in the future. If it does, it would be good news, in fact, excellent news for everyone living in the region if Russia, if Serbia finally separates itself from Russian policy. Uh, the unfortunate situation right now is, uh, I think, that connection is just too deep. Whether the connection between the countries or the very deep and dangerous, if I might add, connection between the two leaders, Vucic and, and Putin. So. The question is even if he would want to get separated from Russia, whether he dares to do that. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your very outspoken way to uh, answer those questions. And now there's the chance also for the public. Are there questions? I see already, yes, in the center, we are looking for a micro. Over there, we usually say ladies first, and then, of course, the man. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Clarissa Kastek. Um, I'm a DA alumni and an Austrian diplomat. I'm currently based in Vienna, but I will actually be going to Kosovo at the end of June. I'll be posted there. I'm yeah. very looking forward to it. Looking forward to welcoming you. Thank you very much. Um, so my question concerns um, a new platform which emerged in the context of the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, the European political community. Um, Kosovo is a member. Um, you attended the first meeting in Prague. And I was just interested if you also saw this, the EPC, as a, as a platform, as a means, which could perhaps also enhance the momentum that you were describing earlier about Kosovo's integration internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. The EPC, when the idea was first put out, we had a lot of questions, uh, especially countries in the Western Balkans were asking, well, 
and others who are striving to join, join the EU were asking, is this another waiting room where we will be put and then we will be waiting for a couple of more decades until we become members of the EU? But we got reassurances that that's not what it is. It was actually a platform to give us a voice because we, we do have the so-called uh, European Union Western Balkans summits that happen sort of once a year and I represent the country there and these are important talks, but the EPC is aimed at making sure that the platform to which we talk to is bigger than just the European Union uh, member states. So we are considered to be a founding member because we agreed to it from the very beginning. Uh, and the very first meeting in Prague, I believe, was quite successful in the sense that it allow allowed us to uh, present our views and push forward what we believe is an agenda for peace and stability in the Western Balkans to all the other members of the European political community, which again is of course all EU member states, but also other countries uh, that either strive to become member of the EU or at least give some sort of a contribution to peace and stability. Uh, the United Kingdom is, is one of them, which is of course not in the EU, but nevertheless is one of the key members of the European continent, uh, a country of the what we call it the quint that has uh, supported us historically so much. And it's so important for us to have the UK as well as some other members at the EPC level. So uh, we're not just a member, we're actually a very active member. We contribute uh, a lot in documents, statements, preparations, and we will continue to do so in the second summit, which will be held in, in Mo Moldova. I look forward to, to participating there on behalf of Kosovo. Okay, yes, the neighbor. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so at first, thank you very much for quite an uh, informative uh, lecture. And I have two short questions about the, uh, the Kosovo, uh, Kosovo membership of international organizations. I'm now sure uh, because of the Article 4 of the agreement, uh, Serbia is no uh, obstacle anymore. But, but probably uh, China and Russia is uh, objected to the UN, uh, membership of Kosovo in the United Nations. And uh, when it comes to the European Union, the five EU membership uh, do not still, uh, do not yet uh, recognize the independence of Kosovo. And my que the first question is, uh, how can Kosovo uh, overcome these obstacles in the United Nations and European Union? And the second question is, okay, the membership of European Union or other international organization is a uh, uh, huge merit for Kosovo and these organizations uh, gi uh, will give Kosovo prosperity or stability. But my, and my question is, uh, what can Kosovo uh, contribute to uh, these organizations? So what can Kosovo contribute to EU, NATO, OSC, uh, sorry, uh, or United Nations? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you're right, which is why at the beginning I spoke of NATO, the EU, and then a number of UN agencies where neither Russia nor China have a veto. And then I, I did talk about the UN as, of course, our ultimate goal, but fully aware that unless Russia and China do not use the veto at the UN Security Council, of course, we cannot get to have the membership adopted by the General Assembly. Uh, we're aware of procedures, but at the same time, uh, what we're doing is to get there, of course, we first need to make sure that we have as many recognitions possible so that when the time comes, and hopefully there will be uh, at some point in time uh, uh, a Russian leadership that will decide to not use the veto. I mean, we're, our patience is not gonna go grim, uh, and Kosovo will remain independent and sovereign forever. So we will strive until that moment comes uh, and we will become a, U a UN member. Uh, but I believe that the fact that Serbia uh, has committed to not object to membership in any international organization will have a positive effect on the position of, of others, if they are to implement, that is, again. Uh, so, uh, while Serbia itself does not have a veto at the UN or anywhere else for that matter, we are aware of, of Russia and China. I wouldn't put Russia and China in terms of how they would act at the same level, to be honest. At least that's my experience. I've been dealing with recognitions and memberships 
in my entire political career, at least from the contacts that we've had. Uh, there is a difference there. So I believe that, especially when it comes to China, there can a, a way can be found for an abstention there. Uh, but Russia obviously is at a hardcore veto right now. So, <laughs> so we we're hoping to uh, for that to change. Obviously, uh, uh, it's going to take time, but we will get there. Uh, when it comes to EU membership, the situation is different. And let me explain why. The first issue is that the vast majority of EU member states, I believe, will move on with recognition sooner rather than later, no matter what Serbia does. That's first. Secondly, to just start the process to get the candidate status, there are procedural ways how we can get there, even without the formal recognitions of the five. One example is the when we signed the Stabilization and Association Agreement, which was unanimously voted by everyone in the EU, uh, we added an article uh, which said this agreement is signed because, you know, it's a contractual agreement that is signed with independent countries, EU and independent countries. It says this agreement has been signed with Kosovo under the understanding and no prejudice on individual member states' position on Kosovo status. So something similar can be added at this procedural level so that the non-recognizers can feel... Uh, okay when it comes to their individual position, but not block the union's position and the start of uh, the work of the European Commission with Kosovo. So to mandate the commission to work with us in terms of getting a candidate status and then opening negotiations. Uh, but I think throughout all of this, we will be gaining most of these recognitions, some a little earlier. There are countries within the f this five that is are very much ready. Uh, to, to take that decision, there are some that will will take a little bit of time. Uh, so on the five EU members or the four NATO members that have not recognized, there are models that can be used for us to proceed towards membership uh, quite soon. And they're not as hardcore against us as Russia is. So there is really a big difference. Some of these countries among the five are great friends of Kosovo. We have excellent Trade cooperation, by the way, excellent uh, cooperation in so many areas, including political cooperation. They have liaison offices in Kosovo led by ambassadors, and we're on the right path on these ones. So I believe that uh, very soon we will have a complete change of circumstances when it comes to EU and NATO. In the Council of Europe, for example, no one has a veto, so we need two-thirds, uh, which we believe we have. We just need the committee of ministers there to, to proceed as soon as possible, take the case to the parliamentary assembly and finally have, have a vote in this human rights organization. Now, on your question, what can Kosovo contribute? Look, I believe that the sheer size of a country should not determine its impact. I know we're a small country geographically, but I believe that we have an important contribution to give to peace and stability in the region, in the continent, and beyond. And don't forget, we are one of the most successful projects of peace building and state building in the history of the world. So we can also offer quite a lot of good experience. Uh, and at the same time, Kosovo is contributing to peacekeeping missions abroad. The Kosovo Security Force is already serving side-by-side -side partners on a bilateral basis at this point with the US Army, with the UK Army, and we're signing agreements with the rest to serve, to have our army, which is one of the most professional in the region and beyond, to serve elsewhere and to uh, promote peace and stability uh, in other parts of the world. So yes, we can contribute in that sense, but at the same time, the biggest contribution that a country can give, especially given the circumstances that we're facing after Russia's invasion of Ukraine nowadays is fight for our and promote for our shared values. Democracy is what we will give back. A resilient, a credible ally is what others will get from us. And as President Biden recently mentioned in his address in, in Poland, in, in times of turmoil, in times of challenges, where you stand is truly matters. And who stands with you is what makes all the difference. We have seen that in Kosovo in 1999. 
We would have never survived if it wasn't for friends and allies, big or small, standing with us. So we want a chance to give back. Okay, Mr. Felinger. Oh, yeah. Micro, just a moment. I'm just coming from Pristina and I was a bit delayed. I apologize. I'm coming from this economic mission now in Pristina from the Austrian Chambers of Commerce and I would like to ask you because Austrian big state energy companies are engaged in Bulgaria, Albania, Macedonia and they're very successfully there. And in your deliberations with the Austrian authorities, did you also raise the opportunity to send some of the big Austrian state-owned energy companies to Kosovo to lift and do some of these major economic energy opportunities and help your country in this transition? And if I may as well, I don't know if it was exclusively covered already the NATO topic, because I'm also campaigning for Austria to join NATO. I want to uh, congratulate also um, President and former Minister Fassland for openly endorsing NATO membership of Austria. This was really very decisive and I hope there is debate. And my question to you, Mrs. President, is, is it helpful, the Austrian neutrality in the debate about Serbia? Because the um, Serbian president is always um, talking about Austrian neutrality as a kind of role model to enter the European Union without confronting the past uh, crimes and he has now made outrageous statement on the 24th of March again, uh, when it was uh, the tw uh, 24 years of uh, the liberation of uh, Serbia as well uh, from Milosevic by the NATO intervention. And he said things that was really very much against us. And so I would like to ask you this question. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to uh, the energy companies, obviously I make the case for more Austrian investment including in the energy sector, which is a key sector that we're trying to reform and bring in more renewables. Unfortunately, we are very much dependent on coal so far, but we need to have uh, more aggressive, positively speaking, investment in the energy sector when it comes to renewables. So obviously in every meeting that I have with uh, Austrian uh, politicians, but at the same time Austrian businesses, I, I invite them to look at Kosovo as a market where they could invest in this, in this uh, area. When it comes to NATO, um, Austria has supported Kosovo's membership in each and every international organization where we have applied. Everyone. There's not a single membership bid or aspiration of Kosovo that Austria has not supported. Now, when it comes to relations between Kosovo and Serbia, Austria is not neutral. Austria has recognized Kosovo's independence. Austria has voted in favor of Kosovo's membership everywhere that we have applied. Of course, it's Austria's decision uh, in terms of uh, their NATO uh, membership. But Kosovo believes that, as I said, uh, I believe before you came in, that to be in NATO means to be safe, but also to be in NATO means to protect the values that have brought us together. I don't believe that Serbia belongs to these like-minded countries like Kosovo and Austria that share those same values. So obviously the Serbian president will talk about the Austrian neutrality model. Serbia is not neutral. Serbia is with Russia. Serbia has chosen its path. Serbia supports Putin. Serbia gives money for Putin's war against Ukraine by signing s deals with Gazprom. Uh, Serbia is not neutral. So when they talk about Austrian neutrality, of course, is just part of their propaganda. As it is, the statements on the March uh, 24th anniversary of, of NATO humanitarian intervention, which is, I believe, one of the brightest days in the history of humankind because it showed that when democracies stand together against tyrannies and against genocidal regimes, they always triumph. March 24th, 1999 was a triumph of democracy. That's what it was, which is why it's a day to celebrate. What will Serbia do is typical of what they have done throughout their history. Propaganda, it's typical of what they do. Dance to Putin's tune. That's what they will continue to do. But we have been there back in 1999. We know what happened, and so do you. 
every single country that came to the defense of a defenseless people, that came to the rescue of a people that were victims of a genocide, should be proud of stopping on the ongoing uh, genocide. That's what happened in Kosovo, and that's what NATO did, stopped the ongoing genocide. Anything else is simply history revisionism, which we should all fight. Yeah, next is uh, AIS, uh, Cooperator Lawrence, in the last row. No, in the last row, just behind you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, Lawrence Kettle from the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. I also particularly focus on the Western Balkans. Uh, I wanted a very, I have potentially dozens of questions to ask you, but I think I'll restrict myself to just two small ones. Article 7 of the agreement between Pristina and Belgrade actually stipulates that uh, that Kosovo will ensure an appropriate level of self-management for the Serbian community. Now, Given that uh, you've mentioned it before, Serbia's very close ties to Russia, including pro-Kremlin elements, the Wagner Group, and so on and so forth, and we actually have confirmed sightings of them on the borders, are you concerned that these new self-governed, sorry, self-managed territories could potentially be um, bases for pro-Kremlin uh, entities, and that means within your borders. Uh, I ask because, of course, this refers to a matter of Kosovo national security, and what provisions would you like to see to try and make sure that doesn't happen? And secondly, the very simple question is, in your personal opinion, why hasn't Vucic signed the agreement? And for that matter, have you and your prime minister not signed the agreement because he hasn't signed it? Or is there something else in this document that you're not 100% certain of and would like to see further developed? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> look, Kosovo did not want Article 7 in the agreement. Um, I'll be very honest. We have been working with our allies and partners uh, forever. And the gratefulness of the people of Kosovo is, is, is there to stay forever. But I believe that it has not been the right choice to push Kosovo in this direction. Uh, in the sense that, you know, in the US they say it's easier to twist your friend's arm. So we are your friends. We are the friends of the Euro-Atlantic community. We are the friends of democracies. And um, Kosovo right now, as it stands, has the highest level of protection for minority community rights in Europe and beyond. Let me ask, for example, a question, and I'm sure here there are members from different countries coming. In how many of your countries um, a minority community representing just 3 to 4% of the population has the veto right over any amendment of the Constitution, even if it's a technical one. I don't know of another country. Out of 120 members in our parliament, 10 seats are guaranteed and reserved for Serbs. Those 10 MPs have the right to block any constitutional mm -hmm. amendment any constitutional amendment in our constitution. In how many of your countries, three to four percent of the population can block the change or the reform in education? The Serbian community can block that, and they have, by the way, been blocking it for so many mandates, because it's called a law on vital interest, any law related to education. Or electoral reforms, they can block it in Kosovo. 10 MPs can block the will of 110 others in the parliament. Not to talk about other individual rights, not to talk about rights at the local level, or in any other segment of life and institutions. So they already have that. And despite of the fact that Serbia continues to commit gross violations of human rights against the Albanian minority living in the Presheva Valley, no one asks Serbia 
to provide enhanced rights or just implement the ones that they foresee in their constitution or that they have committed to through international treaties and conventions? No one. But they come to Kosovo and ask for enhanced rights. So what is Article 7 about? Article 7 is about self-management of the Serbian community in terms of individual human rights, not in terms of the collective human rights. So that is the, 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 the difference. It's not a self-management that is given to a territory. It's a self-management that is given to the Serbian community, meaning the citizens. So yes, uh, that in line with Article 10, which of course obliges Kosovo to continue to implement all of the agreement that has signed, can be interpreted, among others, as an association of municipalities but only and only, and that brings me to the second part of your first question, uh, what kind of guarantees do we have to stop a national security threat towards Kosovo through this article? The guarantee is this. The first is the Constitutional Court decision of Kosovo of 2015, which does not allow for this association to have any executive power or turn into a third la layer of governance. Uh, so the constitutional court decision, as I have stated for years, is the guiding light on how to deal with this issue. That is the first guarantee. It's internal. The second guarantee is sort of external. It comes from our partners. And these are written guarantees that they would never allow another Republika Srpska in our region. They would never allow for executive powers or a third layer of, or, or, of governance, and that this is simply an association where municipalities come together for coordination, to coordinate in relation to the rights that belong to minority communities. Uh, that being said, it still remains an extremely complex matter which means that we are extremely vigilant and that at no cost shall we allow Kosovo to become a non-functional state. We are not afraid of giving our minority communities enhanced rights. Quite the opposite. We want them to feel free. We want them to feel secure and safe and included and appreciated because we see a value in diversity. Although as a majority, we are more than 92% of the population. However, we believe that it's a value to respect others, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their language. And being discriminated almost uh, you know, our entire lives until 1999, we don't want anyone else living in our country to be discriminated. We have felt that in our skin during the Milosevic regime, and we, we know what it is. Nevertheless, we need to make sure that rights are individual rights that are enjoyed by Serbs, not such that in the collective it would allow Serbia to use it as an instrument to undermine Kosovo's statehood, sovereignty, and security. Of course, in all of this process, we will need the support of our allies, and we need to make sure that uh, while Serbia continues to threat with destabilizing forces, and to threat with use of violence, that we will have the support of our allies in, in all of these fronts. And the second question, why hasn't Vucic signed? Look, the agreement calls for, as I said, uh, Serbia not objecting Kos to Kosovo's membership in any international organization. Uh, no ifs or buts or a footnote there. And secondly, it says, uh, the parties um, are aware of the inviolability of frontiers and respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty and the protection of national minorities. The parties shall develop normal, good neighborly relations with each other on the basis of equal rights. It also talk about both parties mutually recognizing respective documents and national symbols, national symbols, not regional or anything, national symbols of each other, It talk, including passports and so on talks about both parties being guided by the aims and principles laid down at the UN Charter, including the sovereign equality of states. talks about respect of independence, right to self-determination. It talks about protection of human rights and so on. And uh, 
refraining from the threat of use of force and, and a lot of other articles, which uh, we call it a de facto recognition because that's what it is. And that's the reason why Vucic refrained from signing because he wants to once again look good in front of partners, but then run away from obligations. He wants to once again uh, not walk the talk. That's what he wants. And why didn't we sign? Simply because Serbia didn't. I don't think it would have been wise for Kosovo to sign unilaterally because this agreement clearly refers to contracting parties. There need to be two parties. Uh, but then again, as I said earlier, the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties does recognize uh, the legally binding nature of agreements even at times when they are not signed, if there is a meeting of mind and if there's the element of consent, uh, which there was at least that day in Brussels. Uh, now, how Serbia will act, it's a completely different matter. But what we count on is the commitment of our partners that they will support Kosovo's further international integration, even if Serbia does not implement their part. And we shouldn't be surprised if they don't. Okay. Next is Ambassador Kircheva from the Vienna Economic Forum. Madam President, thank you very much for being here and for the opportunity to listen so clear and so good words about uh, the Kosovo and the, the, the history. I am very pleased to inform that on 8th of May, Vienna Economic Forum will organize, together with uh, the government of Kosovo, our Vienna Economic Talks Pristina meeting 2023 with the aim to bring investors from different countries and from different branches. My short question. What do we think about the future, about the future of Bo Open Balkan Initiative? I think the future is with the Berlin process. That's where the future lies. And that's the future to which we are committed. Um, the reason why I mentioned trade does not equal trust is because in, in these regional initiatives, we need to make sure that if one of the countries, in this case Serbia, wants to, on a daily basis, attacks the other, violates its territorial integrity, does not consider you as equal, at least we have, at a European Union level, some sort of, uh, um, how would I say, um, the guarantor that can make the initiative functional. In the Berlin process, we have the guarantor, which is the European Union. We have a specific country that took over to push forward for implementation, for agreements, and a joint um, uh, market. In the, in the Open Balkan Initiative, many of this, of course, is missing because Serbia was one of the initiators, and we believe that they would just run away from agreements, from obligations. And at the same time, they are not ready to consider Kosovo as an equal partner in the initiative. And the initiative uh, never respected the principle of all-inclusiveness and at the same time the principle of equal fo footing of all uh, parties. Uh, so I believe that the future lies with the Berlin process, uh, whether we're talking about the four freedoms, whether we're talking about economic cooperation, a joint uh, market of, of the region, a joint regional economic market, and so on. All of this is already happening, so I, I don't see the need of multiplying efforts where we should rather focus on what's already there, and it's pretty successful. The only times when it's not successful is when Serbia does not implement, on w or when Bosnia does not implement because of Dodik. So... Uh, other than that, the rest of the countries have been cooperating in an excellent way. Uh, but of course, we fully respect other countries' choices. So if a country has made their choice to join the Open Balkans, it is their sovereign choice. We fully respect it. Uh, but this is Kosovo's sovereign choice. The Berlin process is the way forward. Yeah, we have uh, very soon reached one and a half hours, and this is the limit we usually have. Last question uh, Mrs. Sinigoy. Thank you very much for your very detailed 
and specific, speaking of your mind, because I think the general um, assembly here <laughs> in this room has only very superficial knowledge of things which are going on in your country. Now, given uh, the very subversive actions of Serbia in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and in your parts, would you, in your talk with Madame van der Leyen as your interlocutor, advise her not to take Serbia into the EU? Thank you. Um, I, uh, President von der Leyen has been one of the biggest supporters of our region's path towards European integration. But in talks with her and in talks with every other EU official, we insist on a merit-based process. What that means is that if a country in our region has no respect for democratic principles, no respect for rule of law, pushes forward crime and corruption, violates freedom of speech and freedom of media, and makes sure that no democratic standards apply, well, if there are no EU values in there, that member should not move ahead in their respective European integration path. Uh, so while we believe that the future of the entire Western Balkans should be in the European Union, at the same time, we're not asking for a shortcut. We're asking to be looked at for what we are and what we do, not just what we say, especially what we do. So Serbia has in particular violated every single principle including the principle of good neighborly relations, which are required to move ahead on their European path. I hope they change. If they do, of course, we will fully support their European integration path. Uh, but uh, they will need to do a lot to get there, including fighting crime and corruption within their own country, including uh, supporting freedom, basic freedoms, uh, within their system, including supporting the rights of minority communities, uh, especially the rights of Albanians who live in Presheva Valley, because according to international organizations, Serbia has been committing uh, ethnic cleansing through administrative means uh, against the Albanians uh, who live in the Presheva Valley. So there is a lot that they have to do, and we're very outspoken in the fact that countries should not get into the EU just because they say so, but because of what they do and what they represent. So, yes, we've, uh, we've discussed this, but of course it's, it's a matter for EU member states uh, to decide. And by the way, I don't think there should be EU money without EU values as well. Unfortunately, Serbia continues to get a lot of money, uh, undeserved money from the European Union. But sometimes they use that money to commit crimes, for example, they used EU trucks to create military-style barricades in Kosovo. They shouldn't use the EU uh, money for the sake of paying illegal structures, criminal structures in, in uh, North Kosovo. So I think the EU should be extremely careful on, on where its money goes because while it encourages an autocrat, at the same time it discourages democratic countries in our region those who truly care about democracy and rule of law. Yeah, before we close, I just want to announce uh, we will have uh, another, I think, quite interesting event on April 19. Uh, Prime Minister of Slovakia, uh, Eduard Heger, will be here and uh, give us a speech and a lecture on a Slovak vision of Europe. Uh, yeah, and before we close and before I want to thank Mrs. President, I also want to invite you in the name of AIS, the name of the ambassador also uh, to have a glass of wine together with us uh, afterwards. And now I really want to thank you, Mrs. President. Kosovo is a young state young nation, eager, eagerly looking forward. And I think you have become a symbol for that. Young lady, eager and competent, looking forward, being very outspoken, unusual in such a function, certainly, but quite an experience for all of us. 
Thank you so much. Thank we you. want to thank you uh, for being ready to come here to give us a lecture, to answering in the way you did it to all the questions. Thank you so much, and we wish you all the best for a good future and for much, much success. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. The wine will be served next room. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Thank you, it's been yeah, a pleasure. It was great. Thank you so much. Stash, stash, hey, microphone in.